have these great men and ladies of God to come and share their burden with us. And this is no small thing for me to be here for our 50th. In 1996, I went back to my home state, Texas. They invited me to be their uh, Bible teacher for their 50th anniversary. So this is the second one that I've been in, and this, this is just great. Then yesterday, to see Brother and Sister Eastman honored for their many years of labor, and service in the work of the Lord. And to Brother Putnam, our district superintendent and our district board, we want you to know we love you, love you dearly. We appreciate all that you're doing. And for all of you saints who have come uh, here to this Bible class, I, I really do appreciate this. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking on a subject that is very near to my heart. It, it, it will have some tough areas in it, okay? I'm not preaching this to be tough, but uh, some of it's going to almost be like surgery without being put to sleep. But uh, uh, nevertheless, it's very fundamental, very, very fundamental. So while you're standing, if you will turn with me to the book of Matthew, the 10th chapter. And while you're turning, I've had several people to asked me, said, Brother Grant, you never finished your story about your debate yesterday. And I, I started it, but I didn't finish it. The bottom line was that I debated this minister for five hours. And um, we started seven, we went to 12. And uh, finally he admitted that the early apostles did indeed baptize in Jesus' name. He believed that. One man from his church who was an alcoholic, had been an alcoholic, he said, Pastor Jackson, he said, you know, I love you, I love you dearly. But Pastor Grant has proven to us that we really need to get baptized in Jesus' name. He said, would you baptize me in Jesus' name? He's talking about the, the Baptist minister. And the Baptist minister says, no, I won't do it. He said, you mean to tell me that if the apostles baptize in Jesus' name, you won't baptize me in Jesus' name? He says, no, I won't do it. Well, midnight came. It was time for me to leave. So I got up and left them all in the house with the two ministers and went home. 4.30 the next morning, I received a phone call from Lonnie Fuller. Lonnie says, I've got to go to work. And I can't work until I'm baptized in Jesus' name. So I met he and his family at ch the church. And we baptized, I think, eight or nine people. And out of those eight or nine, uh, one of them is a pastor of one of our UPC churches. And one is an associate pastor of a UPC church. I uh, don't like debates because sometimes attitudes uh, get in the way. And I think it's some, something that is as sacred as Calvary. Should never be exposed to people by people with wrong attitudes. The whole story of the cross, it's all a symbol of death, death to self. From the Garden of Gethsemane to the final cry of our Savior on the cross, it's all about forgiveness, it's about attitude. Jesus sent his 12 out, and this is what we're reading from today, Matthew the 10th chapter, we read verse 7 through 9. Jesus said, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. 
And then we want to go to verse 14. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when ye depart out of the house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Now normally when people do this, they display a bad attitude. I've, I've actually had a couple of different denominations knock on my door when I didn't receive them. I saw them when they leave, left, do this with their hands and do this with their feet and what they're doing they're shaking the dust off their hands and feet and which was okay with me uh, <clears throat> verily I say unto you it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city now notice verse 16 Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. God bless you. You may be seated. So verse 16 talks to us about our attitude. Now it does not say that we're wolves among sheep. It says that we are sheep among wolves. Paul addresses the attitude of Christians in the book of Philippians, and I'll not go to a, that specific reading, but he said some people preach Christ for contention's sake. In other words, when you have the truth and you know the truth, and you know that you can win arguments with the truth, then it's easy to manifest a bad attitude simply because you know you can win the argument. But you see, this is not about who wins the argument. It's about who wins the soul. That's so important. It has been said that if you're selling a piece of real estate, that the most important factors in the sale of the real estate are, number one, location. Number two, location. Number three, location. And the most important factors in conveying or selling the gospel to people are, number one, attitude. Number two, attitude. Number three, attitude. So I want to speak today on the subject, attitude, attitude, attitude. Now we have to understand, according to Hebrews 4, verse 12, the Bible says the word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God can not only read your mind, but he has the ability to read your intent, or maybe I should say, what causes you to think the way that you think? Why do some people think the way they do? You see, the Holy Ghost is able to correct that part of you also. Now, it is imperative that you understand that even though you are to have the proper attitude, that when it comes to the gospel message, that there is no compromise. Under any circumstances, the gospel is always the same. I believe in order to be born again that you need to first repent of your sins, be baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I believe that if this is imperative, then I would be a literal fool 
to seek out a means to convey it that's not productive. But for me to seek out the most productive means to convey the message to people is only a wise thing if it's imperative. So if you've been teaching, let's say, a home Bible study, if you've been teaching for years and you haven't won anyone to the Lord, maybe you need to do a checkup from the neck up. Maybe there's something not quite right. Uh, if you're not productive, because, you know, yesterday I talked about the grace of God that brings salvation to every man. One scripture that comes to my mind this morning is that he, according to John 1, he is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That every man that comes into the world is exposed to a particular revelation that comes from God. Maybe inwardly they may not know it's from God, but nevertheless that exposure is there. That's the reason why that we must love people that are unsaved. And another thing that I think that we have not done the kingdom of God a favor in, and that is sometimes our attitude toward other denominations. Sometimes we show too much of a mean spirit toward other denominations, or we try to show a superior spirit, like we have it and you don't have it. And I know of one man that I personally heard him say concerning someone of the denomination of the person he was talking to, he said, oh, he doesn't have an ounce of God. Well, that's beside the point. That's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to get this person to, to believe what you believe. Sister Grant and I, uh, we eat out a lot. Of course, it's just the two of us in the house and I don't really know why we need a kitchen, but we have one. But uh, we eat out a lot. And there's certain restaurants that we go to more than others, but one comes to my mind. And there was a lady that came over, and she had a little joke that she wanted to tell us about air conditioning, which is a funny little thing. And, uh, and she and, and never had come to our table, never had talked with us much, but she felt comfortable in doing this. And then after she'd left, uh, our server came over and said, well, you know, Pastor, when you and your wife walk in here, there's a buzz that goes throughout the entire restaurant that the minister's here, Pastor Grant's here. Uh, when Sister Grant uh, took a fall from a horse about five years ago and, and cracked her uh, pelvis bone, well, I remember going into this restaurant alone and people wanted to know where she was and I said, she's in the hospital. Oh my, the manager came over along with a couple of other people. Uh, I asked him, I said, uh, would you pray for Darlene? She's in a lot of pain. I didn't know that they met, they thought I met right now. And uh, so they all bowed their heads and, <laughs> and we all prayed. Uh, the manager, along with two or three of the servers, and they began to pray right then. I was amazed how much this really opened the door. Uh, we were in having a pastor staff meeting in one of their larger round tables. And one of the servers came over. She had been involved in a car wreck that day. She came over and said, uh, Pastor, and she was one of the ladies that was praying for Sister Grant. She came over and said, I was in a car wreck today on my way. And she said, I can't afford to go home, and I'm in a lot of pain. She said, would you pastors pray for me? And so she stood there, and I prayed for her. Now, I didn't pray 100 decibel prayers or anything like that. But we just simply prayed for her. She wiped the tears from her eyes and went on serving, did not go home. 
The next time I saw her, she thanked me. She said, you know, I was working away and realized I didn't have any pain in my body. So. There was a lady in the store. It happened to be the Cracker Barrel of Madison. And she came over and she said, you know, the many, many times I've been in this place of business, this is the most touching thing I've ever seen take place. Oh, I, I go in there. One of the, the hostess, uh, she goes to another church not far from ours, and I always ask her, were you in church? Uh, did the preacher do well? Oh, she tells me. I said, well, I was in church too, and our, our pastor did a bang-up job. Just, you know. You know, superb job, but he's going to do better next week. You know, you know uh, <clears throat> isn't it true that most all of our converts are won by new converts? They are. And, uh, of course, there's a couple of reasons why. One is that they know a lot more people that are not saved. And we know. I think one of the greatest tragedies of spiritual growth, if I can call it that, is that you've been in the church five to ten years and you don't know anybody but church people. And you don't really try to know anybody but church people. Now, I'm, I'm saying this not to put any feathers in our hat in Madison, but since the turn of the century in Madison, we've had over 3,000 new births. Now, you can't have that many people coming to the Lord unless you have a steady flow of visitors. I'm talking about all the time, all the time. And I think that we need to make the gospel attractive. I said, I believe that we need to make the gospel attractive. Amen. See? And you may say, well, I have great holiness standards, and that's what attracts visitors. Well, <clears throat> I do agree that our holiness standards are imperative, and I, I'm not in favor of compromising not one bit on our holiness standards, our our. our our lifestyle, our lifestyle is separation. I don't care how you cut it. If you read the scripture, you've got to believe in separation. Separation from the world. But holiness standards are designed to make us transparent. So that when people see us, they don't really see us. They see our God. Really. And Peter says concerning the ladies, you know, some ladies can get two or three scriptures under their belt and they want to go in and take their unsaved husband and blast him. But he said, no, it's not with your outward apparel. But he said, it's the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. Now, please keep in mind I'm going to probably overwhelm you with scripture here. I don't have a long time today. Uh, we've taken a, a, quite a bit of time for something that was very, very important. And that's missions. But nevertheless, we are believers of the scripture. Don't you remember when James and John were trying to prepare the way of the Lord for Samaria? And when they went there, the people would not received them because they felt that Jesus had set his mind on going to Jerusalem. And when they came back, they reported to the Lord. And then they added a little addendum to their report, maybe a request. They said, Master, should we act like Elias did and call down fire from heaven to consume them? 
And Jesus said, hey, boys, you have a dirty, rotten attitude. Now, that's my interpretation of this. You know not what spirit you're of. In Pentecost, sometimes we say they have a bad spirit. It's okay to say that, but somehow we connect it with the devil. And You know, let me tell you something. You can cast out devils all day long, but you don't cast out human flesh. That's something you have to discipline yourself to. And it is amazing that Jesus had such a great ministry of casting out devils, and the apostles did, but they spent a lot of time also talking to us about our human spirit, the human side, the works of the flesh. So Jesus was able to separate the sin from the sinner. John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I've been fortunate enough to preach in a good number of districts and churches in the UPC. And I appreciate the United Pentecostal Church. I mean, I really appreciate it. I won't be making some complimentary statements about the UPC and about um, our leadership and our leadership here in our district. But I would be the first to tell you that I do believe that we need a kinder, gentler United Pentecostal Church. That some of the criticism that's come our way has come our way as a result of some people among us having bad attitudes, just going out and blasting people. If you're going to win someone to the Lord, you've got to win them to yourself first. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is the character of God. Character is defined as what you are. In other words, it's the core of what you are. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, the word against, the phrase against such there is no law, that simply means that there is no law against you loving as much as you possibly can. There is no law against you being as meek as you possibly can. In other words, there's no limit against which there is no limit. So you can love all you want to love. Now, it might not fit the particular pleasures of somebody near you, but I don't see anything in the fruit of the Spirit if that's the character of God, if that defines what God is. And, and, and I think I'm correct in that. You can turn to 1 Corinthians 13. You know, the Bible says that, that, that Jesus is, is love. 1 Corinthians 13 is a love chapter. Uh, let, me just, let me just read just a part of this. And, and, and what I'm going to do, rather than put love in them. We'll put Jesus in there. Uh, Jesus suffered long. Jesus was kind. Jesus envied not. Jesus vaunteth not himself. He was not puffed up. He did not behave himself unseemly. He sought not his own. He was not easily provoked. He thought no evil. He rejoiced not in iniquity, but he rejoiced in truth. He bore all things. He believed all things. He hoped all things. He endured all things. Jesus never failed. Now, does that sound like Jesus? Now, <clears throat> challenge yourself and do this uh, frequently. Challenge yourself by putting your own name there. John suffers long. John is kind. John envies not. John vaunteth not himself. He's not puffed up. He does not behave himself unseemly. He seeks not his own. He is not easily provoked. He thinks no evil. He rejoices not in iniquity, but he rejoices in truth. He bears all things, he believes all things, he hopes all things, he endures all things. John never fails. So the next time that you think that you know it all, 
and you're ready to blast someone into eternity because you have the truth, you need to get this passage out and put your name in it. Attitude, attitude, attitude. Ephesians 5.21, the Bible tells us, we're talking about our relationships now with each other. Ephesians 5, verse 21, the Bible says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. And then we go to Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians, the second chapter. And I want to read verse uh, 1 through verse 3. The Bible says, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, beholding one another in one mind. Now notice this, let nothing be done through strife. In the 38 years that I've been pastor at Calvary Gospel Church, I don't know how many times that people have come up to me and told me what they told somebody on the telephone. And I just simply quoted this scripture, let nothing be done through strife. Now to you pastors, there's one thing for sure, your people may not always honor you the way that they need to honor you, but we have taught them and told them that the Word of God is infallible. And you can pull rank on your people anytime you want to by using Scripture. And you can have a good attitude. But if you try to pull rank without Scripture, your attitude can get messed up. So I just simply remind people of what the Bible says. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, we know according to Scripture that, well, right now in, there's a big, big debate in Arizona about the immigration law. Now, the Department of Justice is going to consider as whether that they're going to allow uh, Arizona to uphold this law. Now, this is kind of a, a I think, kind of a, a funny twist to everything. The immigration law in Arizona simply says that this state considers it a crime for any person to break the federal law concerning immigration. And we will make sure that the people who violate are held accountable. Now, all they're saying is that we want you to uphold the federal law because the Constitution states that no state can make law that exceeds the federal law. So the federal law is the law of the land. You, you do whatever you want to in the states, but you can't violate the federal law. That simply means that, that there, is a, there is an order. There is the federal law, and then there's a the state law, and now they're, 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 they're looking at this. And, and, and you will find that in the Bible, one of the most important things to bring about peace is government. Uh, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Government and peace go hand in hand. If you don't have government, you don't have peace. So what keeps the attitude correct in a local assembly is the government that exists in that assembly. Keeps the attitudes right. 
one of the hardest things in the world for a pastor to do, and that is pastor people that have been in the church 50 years and some five days. There's a vast difference in their convictions. And the only answer to that is that your people have to have a good attitude toward one another. Uh, if, if they don't, they will accuse the pastor of, of uh, being a little prejudiced or being biased, favoring sometimes new people. Now, we know that this same government goes into the home. Children accuse their parents of being unfair, and the thing that I hear all the time is, they don't trust me. And uh, <clears throat> The parents know that when there's a display of human flesh that it's hard to dis it's hard to trust human flesh. So they've been down those roads themselves. So you follow what I'm saying? Well, you don't you don't trust me. Now here here's here's what in the home God has set up order. There is the father, and then there is the mother, and then there's the children. Okay? Now, the father is the head of the household according to Scripture. I said according to Scripture because he's not always the head of the household, but he should be according to, to the Bible. Okay? Now, some of the ladies in the home... They won't follow their husbands because they don't believe in him or they don't trust him. And, and uh, they, they begin to feel that they're kind of entrapped. And, and as a result, then the kids don't follow either one. Then they bring that also into the house of God. And after a while, then the congregation not trusting the pastor. And the pastor's taking it out on the people and using the Bible as a club, you know, to pound people over the heads. Now, it's a good system. It's a perfect system. The only problem is that it is operated by imperfect people. But it is a perfect system. Now, here's what you have to keep in mind, okay? That in the church, just like in the home, you do have a chain of command. You have a father and you have a mother. But then you have several children, and they're all on the same level. And then in the church, you have a lot of people on the same level. Now, the Bible gives the superior permission to pull rank over the subordinate anytime he wants to. And also to pass judgment any time he wants. So you hear this all the time. Oh, you're not supposed to judge. Well, that depends on the context. Not only are you not supposed to, or not only do you have the permission to judge, in many cases you should judge. Johnny, take out the trash. Johnny said, but I don't want to take out the trash. You have a bad attitude. No, I don't. So you're going to let John run the household. You're going to let him to determine. Okay. Now, we're going, to, we're going to drop that aspect of the chain of command. We're going to go to where everybody's on equal ground. I'm talking about, we're not talking about the leadership of the church. We're talking about in the church. Okay. The Bible says that you, we submit to each other. So this brother over here submits to this brother, and this brother submits to that brother. But then Paul, talking to the Philippians, goes one step further, and he said, let every man esteem his brother higher than himself. In other words, you make this man your superior. And if you make this man your superior, that means you submit to him and you lock your jaws and refuse to criticize him because he's your superior. But by the same token, he esteems him 
higher than themselves. He locks his jaws and refuses to criticize this man because he has made him his superior. Therefore, in the house of God, all the saints of God will have a good attitude toward each other. If they hear something they disagree with, they don't feel it is their primary responsibility or perhaps maybe not even their business to be correcting everybody's problem. So they just have a good attitude toward it. Now, <clears throat> to the ministers who are here, we need to listen to this because some, we go to district conferences, we go to general conference, we got a whole lot of equals there. The same law applies to the ministry. When we get in and we, we cast our vote, Proverbs 18, 18, the Bible says, when the lot is cast, contention ceases. That simply means in a democratic situation where everybody has their say, then you can say what you want to say, but when the voting's over, you may not have gotten your way. But remember this. It would be very selfish of you to feel that you always have to get your way. I remember one time in school, I was punished for something I did not do, and when I got home, I got the second whipping. And I told my mother, I want you to go and talk to the teacher. She said, I'm not going to investigate this. I put you in the hands of this teacher. She might be right, and she might be wrong. But then this is what she told me. She said, John, listen to me. It will be good for you emotionally to suffer wrongfully. In other words, to suffer for something you did not do. And you will never associate yourself with Jesus Christ more than for blame to be put on you when you know in your heart you're innocent. One of the best pieces of advice I've had ever because in the 70 years that I have been on this earth, almost 70, how many times have I felt that I got the bad end of the deal? Many times. I will even say this. I served as district superintendent 17 years and there were times, because I, as district superintendent, you don't have a vote. You have a voice, but you don't have a vote. And you may be able to convince the men, but there were times in which our district board wanted to do something, and I wasn't in favor of it. But they voted for it anyway, and I went to the district conference and told everyone and promoted it just like it was my idea. And I was not in favor of it. But you see, that was my responsibility. Now, <clears throat> this is not that painful, is it? Attitude, attitude, attitude. Now, we want to go a step further. Now, <clears throat> Acts eleven twenty six, and this was made mention in our mission service today. They were first called Christians at Antioch. In other words, they were emulating Christ. They were acting just like him. When I was a child, I wanted to be like my dad. Several of his sisters, knowing I wanted to be like that, my aunts told me, said, you're a spitting image of your dad. Spitting image, what does that mean? You remember when Jesus Christ took and spit upon the earth and he made the eye and put it in? The spit represents the life or the breath of the individual. God breathed upon Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. And spit and image is making reference to he's got his father's life in him. 
he's just, man, that made me feel good. And what they were saying about the Christians at Antioch, they're just a spitting image of Jesus Christ. When you see one of them, you see Jesus again. Well, let's look at Jesus. 1 Peter 1, verse 21 through 24. This is talking about the vicarious suffering of our Lord. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth rightly. Who, his own self, bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we're healed. Now I want to go to 1 Peter, the second chapter. We're backing up a little in the same chapter, and we want to read verse uh, 13 through 17. Peter says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now this is, this is something. The, the guy that preached the first message and also defied the government said, sirs, we'd rather believe God, obey God than man. Was the first one to come along and say, you know what you need to do? You need to submit to every ordinance of, of man. Now, he recognized that the ordinance of God is superior to the ordinance of man just as the ordinance of our federal government is superior to state. So what he's doing, he's saying, let's submit to every ordinance of man. This is the will of God concerning you. Now, we all understand that you have to take this in its proper context because, you know, if somebody says you can't preach the gospel, you've got to preach the gospel. Somebody says you can't witness, you've got to witness. You follow what I'm saying? So... Let's go on to, to, to see what he has to say. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as to them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, Jesus Christ came down to the earth to teach us how to follow the ordinances of God. He taught us how to do it. Uh, we know that he came to seek and save that which was lost, but we'll just take two incidents in his life. When he was 12 years old, they went to the temple, or they went to Jerusalem. Um, when they left, they left Jesus. Didn't realize because there was a large company of relatives traveling there they went a day's journey and realized he wasn't with them so they tried to backtrack they find him in the temple and verse 49 through 52 states that when they found him he was he was ministering to all the scribes and they walked in and they listened to him. They were no doubt amazed that he had their attention. He's 12 years of age now. And so Mary and Joseph came up to him and said, Now, you know, you're supposed to left with us. He said, But you know, I'm doing my father's business. Now, we know that everything that ever proceeded out of his mouth was 100% truth. Let me ask you this. Was he doing his father's business or not? He sure was. But now this is what Mary and Joseph said. Now, son, I don't care what you say. You're not pulling rank on us because you were put in our custody for us to take care of you. Now, you come on and go with us. And the Bible says he submitted to his father and mother. Talk about an attitude. 
And he gained favor with God and who? With men. Now, how did he gain favor with men? Everybody that saw him teach it with such great authority, they saw him try to pull rank, and he submitted himself. And those scribes says, wow, what a remarkable, a remarkable young man. He has a bright future. He gained favor with God, and God looked down from heaven and smiled upon him. Later on, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I'm sure that was also being whispered from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then when they falsely accused Jesus and it's time for him to go to the cross, he stood there before Pontius Pilate. The people that were responsible for him being brought there. You know what they did? They went out and hired two known liars to come in and lie against him. They came in and they said, we know he blasphemes because we heard him. And they went on and on and on. Okay. A pilot looked at him and he said, now what do you have to say for yourself? Jesus looked out and he saw his disciples way off out there. Now out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is to be established. And the whole scenario relative to the cross might have been somewhat different. But when he needed a witness, Peter says, I don't know him. I'm not going up there. I'm not getting involved in this. I haven't been involved. And the Bible says he even cursed the damsel looked at him and said, no, I, we know that you know him. He needs you. If you don't go in there and witness, he's going to die because the deck has been stacked, so to speak, because two witnesses have already been spoken. Two witnesses have already spoken. Jesus looked, and they all shook their heads and walked away. So when he needed them, they were not available. Then Pilate says, what do you have to say about this? He opened not his mouth. Do you know why he opens not his mouth? It wouldn't have helped him one bit. Because the two witnesses had already spoken. And he went to the cross, not defending himself. Where bad attitudes crop up, is when you're accused of something and you don't have a friend that'll step up for you. You are the world's worst for defending yourself. He could have called 10,000 angels to come down and deliver him. But he's teaching you and he's teaching me how to live the law that he himself wrote. Attitude, attitude, attitude. And so he went to the cross, died upon the cross, forgave the people, walked on the earth for 40 days, and never one time opened his mouth against the people who crucified him. Why? Because he had forgiven it, them. He put it under the blood. He had a good attitude about it and was profitable in establishing the New Testament church. Attitude, attitude, attitude. Now listen, listen to me. If you will be right with your attitude and right with your actions, you will always win. Right always overcomes might because he submitted. We have the story of the resurrection. There are some things that you're better off to leave in the hands of God and let God take care of it. Now, I want to go to a, 
a painful passage of Scripture. Now, this is painful for me, but yet I, I, I just feel compelled. Let's go to Second Peter and see how much time I have. Uh-oh. I'm really out of time. Can I just go, let's say, 10 minutes? Is that okay? All right. I, let's go to 2 Peter 2, and let's go to verse 19. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Let's, let's back up. I'm in the verse 10. Okay, 2 Peter 2, verse 10. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not, a able, they're not afraid, pardon me, to speak evil against dignities. We've got a whole lot of UPC people. That they, they don't think for a New York second about talking about their pastor or somebody else that they don't particularly like. Where do we get... Are we followers of Christ? That's why I say this is Christianity 101. Where, what have we been reading? Presumptuous. In other words, you see someone, you, you try to figure out why they did certain things. Now listen to this. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before God. i got to tell you, i got to give you my interpretation of this. If you can find another interpretation, you're welcome to challenge me after we say amen today. Okay? Now, someone called me years ago when I was superintendent, telling me all about their pastor, things I didn't like. And I said, well, what do you think I'm going to tell you? I know what you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me just pray for it. I said, well, now wait just a minute before I tell you to pray for him. I want to know, have you been praying for him? Oh, yes. What have you been saying? Well, I've been telling the Lord. I said, no, I want you to please. I said, I want to help you here. Now, you want to be right, don't you? Yes. Tell me what you've been saying. And she started telling me. Hold, hold, hold in a minute. You see, you're taking railing accusations to the throne against your pastor. You thought you could pray about anything, didn't you? No, wrong. You thought you could pray any way you wanted to, maybe I should say, about anything. Because it's just you and God. It's never just you and God when you're praying about somebody else. You know, we are to pray for the, the leaders of our land so that we have peace. Now, it doesn't say pray against them. It says pray for them. You know, let me tell you something. In my tenure as pastor, I've pastored several people that said that they had a, an intercessory prayer ministry, and yet they were mean-spirited. How can you not love people and pray intercessory prayers for people? You'd, you'd think that that if you're doing that, you'd, you'd want to be an advocate of the people, to defend the people. And yet you're praying. No, you're praying against them. No, 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 no. There's a difference in praying against them and praying for them. Don't you dare try to sit in heavenly places and open your big fat mouth against your pastor in the front of God. Angels are smarter than that. They see what he does when the doors are closed. They saw you see what he does when you're not around. And you think that you're that superior? I told you now, this is, this is surgery without put, being put to sleep. I'm going to go on another step further now. I had a minister to call me, and he said, uh, not of this state, good friend of mine. He said, I'm, I'm just, I'm so upset. He said, I, I've got something on my mind, and it's bothering me, and I, I can't, I don't know. He said, I don't know if I should even continue as pastor. And I said, what? He says, 
I don't like what's happening in the White House. I said, well, uh, I'm not too fond of it either, but uh, I pastor people that are Republicans and some that are Democrats and some that are just whatever. You know. I see, in America, we have to understand one thing, that the American lifestyle diametrically opposes the lifestyle of the Scripture. Listen to me. Why? Well, because it wasn't written to a democracy. And the United States government belongs to the people. You have a right to assemble. You have a right to voice your opinion. But let me tell you this. You may have a right and yet not be right when you do it. Just because the government gives you a right doesn't mean that the Bible gives you a right. Did I vote for Obama? None of your business. Do I like what he does? None of your business. I'm not going to tell you here publicly. I pray for him daily. I don't pray against him. I pray for him. He and his wife are still in church in search for a church in Washington, D.C. I hope he walks into Chester Mitchell's apostolic church. That's what I'm, I'm praying. But you see, we cast the lot. And when the lot was cast and he became our leader, don't be emailing me jokes about the president. Don't be emailing me derogatory things about the president. Do I agree with what he's doing? No. Do I want to hear what he's... I'll check on if I want to know. But don't feel like you're a special agent to educate me. I'm just talking about me now. I'm not talking about your friends. I'm not talking about anybody else. So I asked this pastor, I said, you've been all upset. How many emails do you get about what's happening in Washington? He said, oh, every day, 25 or 30. I said, you read them? Oh, yeah. You check them out? Yeah. I said, you know what the problem is? You're in violation of the Bible. You picked up a cause. Any church that becomes so politically minded that they forget about the cross is an error. Do you think these apostles believed in the leaders they had? And let me tell you, when he said obey every ordinance of man and honor governors and honor kings, let me tell you something. What we have in the White House and what we have in Washington is just a little speck when it comes to iniquity compared to what they dealt with. And yet they said it. Now, I am not saying what I'm saying to try to save the president. I'm trying to save you. I want to see the right attitude in you. And I want you to be happy. Because joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. I told my dear friend, I said, do you have a delete button? On your computer? Yes. I said, as soon as they come in, delete, 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 delete. I sometimes delete so many I have to sit there for a long time before the computer can do it. Now, I want to have a good attitude to those people who are sending me these emails. You know, it's just like me up here preaching, preaching about attitude. If I, wa if I walked up here and I had a bad attitude, you know... Something, you know, be like putting a racing stripe on a 1953 Studebaker truck. Just something about it doesn't match. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? And I take notice who sent me. I've had people come and you see, did, did, did you get my email? Yep. Did you read? I said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. I said, I get so many, I had deleted a whole bunch of them and I'm, I deleted yours. After a while, they don't send them because Pastor Grant's not reading them. It's not good for Pastor Grant, see. It, it's me. 
It's not good for me because I'm praying for that man every day. I want to see him go to Chester Mitchell's church. I want to see him receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In the days of the flood, God was long-suffering. That's the way you say long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish. So, you know, if you've been praying against your pastor, stop that sinful thing. You think he's going to hear you? The angels are smarter than that. I'm pretty sure there have been angels that have gone up and said, you know what I saw Pastor Grant do? But don't tell Jesus because that's not our job. Why? Because the all-seeing eye knows everything. Don't run in and tattle on him because that's not our job. Paul talks about the glorious church. I'm going to have to end this, okay? Paul talks about the glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now, if we are genuine in the last days, he's talking about us, us, us. Do you consider your church to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle? Now, just think what I'm saying now. It is when the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ takes sin away. See, God can forgive somebody, but people have a problem forgiving them. That's where the attitudes come in. Oh, I don't you know. Blah, 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 blah. Sister Grant and I had our 50th wedding anniversary last November. We're 50 years and six months already, eight months into our marriage. And if you were to want to stir me up, you just come around and start talking to me about my wife, something about her that you don't like. Then why would you want to go to a brother or sister and talk about your church? What's wrong with feeling that you've got the best church in the world? What's wrong with feeling that? What's wrong with saying, I've got the best pastor in the world? What's wrong with believing in each other and having a good attitude? What's wrong with saying, we've got the best district in the UPC? What's wrong with saying, we've got the best district board in the UPC? What's wrong with saying, we've got the best superintendent in the UPC? Let's give him a great big hand. What's wrong with that? It's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. We submit to each other. We love each other. Our attitudes are right toward each other. What's wrong with believing the United Pentecostal Church is the greatest church organization on the face of the earth? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with believing that David Bernard is the best general superintendent in the world? What's wrong with that? You may say, but I didn't vote for Brother Bernard. You may be a minister. That doesn't make any difference. He's the, he's the man now, and the lot has been cast, and the contention ceases, and we all get behind him with a good attitude. We march on. We're not going out to start our own organization. We may not agree with everything, but let me tell you, it's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, and I'm going to brag on it. It's going to be my church. It's going to be my superintendent. It's going to be my district board. It's going to be my campground. It's going to be my church. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Oh, my. Oh, Jesus. Lift your hands and praise the Lord again. Oh, God. Oh. 
Paul says, Galatians 4, 19, my little children, he said, I travail in birth again till Christ be formed in you. You see, this is the way it goes. If I can control my attitude, I can control my thinking. If I can control my thinking, I control my words. If I control my words, I control my actions. If I control my actions, then I control my habits. If I control my habits, I control my character. And if I control my character, I have control of my destiny. Lift your hands. God bless you.